after you graduate from Notre Dame, you come out to Los Angeles, and suddenly you're thrust into a starring role opposite Frank Sinatra in Come Blow Your Horn. Uh, was that shocking to you that you were in that position so young and so quickly? You know, um, I was too naive and stupid to know that it was it was unlikely that I would come to L.A. and get a job acting in the movies. But I had come here to get a job acting in the movies. So you know, I got what I wanted. Um, I just didn't know until, you know, probably years later that that's a little unusual <laughs> to come here and, uh, and get a job so soon. But I, I really, I went, I, in effect, I went through a kind of uh, uh, compressed version of what everybody goes through. I, I came here, I met a couple of people, I got sent to an agency, an agent saw me there, took me out to the studio where they were casting a movie. I uh, 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 read read for them in the office. I auditioned for them later. I screen tested, um, and I got the part. So uh, it was quick. So, but I wasn't I wasn't surprised because I knew that I should be. I was I was just interested in being in a whole new world, which it was for me. It was you know I never never been to Hollywood, never been to a studio, never acted on a soundstage. So the series of movies that you did after that, you worked with Sidney Pollack and Don Siegel and Francis Ford Coppola. And I mean, did you kind of always want to push your acting career forward or was producing something that was in the back of your mind as far as a, another endeavor to pursue? Well, I, I, I got to enjoy acting because it was fun and interesting and because I was parachuted into this whole new world of making movies but I, I wasn't comfortable with being a movie star or being recognized everywhere or being fawned over or being treated specially and I also felt that I wasn't um, I wasn't cut out to be an actor I, was, I didn't feel like I was I always felt there was somebody else who could do a better job than I could and um, so I, and I also wanted to do more. I, I didn't want to sit and wait for the phone to ring, which is basically an actor's lot. Um, I wanted to, as I put it, I, I wanted to give the party rather than wait to be invited to it. So I started talking to friends about what I wanted to do. Not what I wanted to do, but what I thought could be done. Like, why doesn't somebody make a movie about this? Or why doesn't somebody make a movie about that? Or why doesn't somebody adapt this book? Or how about this? Or how about that actor? How about that? So I kind of started doing what a producer does, which is have ideas, make suggestions, put people together, introduce people, uh, and all of that. And, and it happened several times uh, that my ideas got made into movies. Not with me, because I wasn't really being bold enough or confident enough to do it myself, but I would give people ideas and they would get movies made from them. Not ideas, but you know, this is a really good book. This would really make a good movie. A couple of years later, a year later, it gets made. I think, hmm, maybe I am not as much of an outsider as I thought I was. Huh. Is there anything specific that you remember suggesting to someone that eventually uh, oh, sure. came to fruition? Sure. Uh, um, one of the first things was, um, while I was acting, I thought I read a book that I thought would make a really interesting movie about the generic me, which is to say, a young man in his twenties, just out of college, not knowing what to do with his life, and so on. And it was a little book called *The Graduate*, and it was an unknown book. I mean, it was not a bestseller; nobody knew about it. But I would tell people uh, that I knew. You know, gee, this would make a good, this would make a good movie. You know, <laughs> you know, why don't you, why don't you, you know, why don't you option this book and make a movie out of it? And uh, the trouble was, somebody else already had, and uh, and he got the movie made. I think it was Lawrence, Larry Terman. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, well, maybe that's not such a, 
misguided instinct of mine. And then eventually, um, you had, had you had found Terrence Malick or a script he had read, or you had acted in a short film. I um, what came first. Well, I, I had gotten to be friends with Terry Malick when he was at the AFI, the American Film Institute, as a student, and um, I just really liked it. You know, we just really liked each other. We had a close friendship and. Um, some a lot of common tastes and interests, and so um, I acted for him in his student film, and I kind of helped him get some friends of mine also in that movie. And then I had an idea for a feature film, and I said, "Well, I don't, why don't why doesn't Terry write it?" You know, so I set it up at Warner Brothers for Terry to write his first script, mm. and that was uh, the movie that I got made. Did not succeed at all. Dead head, uh, Called Deadhead uh, Miles. Yeah. Um, I made the two biggest mistakes a producer can make. I hired the wrong director, and I didn't fire him. Uh. <laughs> so the movie was a disaster. Really, it ended up that way. But it launched Terry's career, and it. Uh, I guess I survived it with my own. <laughs> was there any consideration to have? Uh, Terrence Malick directs, or was that? Well, Terry was a film student practically. You know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't go from one incompetent director <laughs> to another one from the studio's <laughs> point of view. I couldn't, I couldn't go to the studio and say, "Let's hire, let's hire, let's let's stop right now." <laughs> you know, it, was, it was too late. The ship had sailed. This, the movie was already shooting, and so. But then. Uh, Following that, you had found uh, David Ward, who I think was a grad student at UCLA. Uh, after that, uh, I met a young, I, I read a script from a, a UCLA graduate, recent graduate named David Ward, and um, I really loved the quality of the writing. And so I asked to meet him and see what he wanted to do next. And he described to me in five minutes a movie about con men in the 30s. And I said, Great. And so I set about to see if I could get financing for that, and I met my partners, Julie and Michael Phillips, and we, the three of us, put our meager pennies together mm -hmm. and, and hired David to, to write The Sting, and also we optioned his script that I had read called uh, Steelyard Blues. After the success of The Sting, and you won an Academy Award with Michael and Julia Phillips, right. did you ever consider directing or was that something that I was I was interested in directing after that a couple of movies um, but I was I was reluctant I was I was not confident in my ability to do a better job again as with acting you know I always say well isn't there somebody better than me to do the job <laughs> and so I could usually say yeah you know that I could usually think of somebody at least as good or better but um, we then optioned a script called Taxi Driver, and for a while I thought, you know, maybe this should be my first directing job, but then I felt, you know, I have partners in it, I don't want to jeopardize the script by imposing myself on it. And um, so I set out to find a script that was really just right for me and didn't have partners to to encumber it or me with. So, um, but around that time, yeah, then that's when I optioned a little script called My Bodyguard, again by a first-time writer. All the movies I've done, almost all, have been first-time writers. Hmm. So, going in style was Martin Brass, I think, first feature film he produced. And, yeah, uh, that was his first film. Yeah, it was always, that was an interesting film, the, the tone of it and the whole construction of it, because you think that it's sort of like, just like a heist comedy, right? but it really has these undertones of darkness with, you know, sort of everything, you know, the, the characters eventually die in succession, yeah. aside from George Burns, and uh, I was wondering, was that sort of a, was that always the take on the material, or was it ever more lighthearted? No, that's, that, that movie, or? that movie was as written. That was, that was the, the script was, the, the script that was written was the script that was shot. It had, it had a, that's what made it kind of special, which is kind of this whimsical, but a little, bit, but sad, happy sad, if you will, or interesting sad tale to it. And that's what made it 
I think that's what made it special. What was it that uh, caught your attention about Martin Brest? Because I think his short film at that time, Hot Dogs for Gigan, was... Uh, Gauguin. You. Yeah, Hot Dogs for Gauguin. Gauguin. He, he had done a, a couple movies that I had seen. He had done um, um, Miss Lonely Hearts uh, at the AFI. And then he did this really short movie called Hot Dogs for Gauguin. But he, he had already caught the eye of Warner Brothers, and that came to me through Warner Brothers. They asked me if I would produce that. Uh, another... Uh, Great film he produced in that same period was Hearts of the West, which is kind of a favorite of mine. Oh, I'm glad you like that. That's people ask me what my favorite movie that I've done is, and I tell them Hearts of the West is my favorite um, because it's so unusual. I mean, although I do like to think that all the movies that I made are very unusual. I think that if there's anything that they share, it's that uh, none of them are like a movie that preceded them. I don't think, um, you know, I don't think, I know, I know Deadhead Miles was nothing like movie that preceded it, but Steel Yard Blues was not, uh, I, I don't think The Sting is like any movie that preceded it, I don't think Taxi Driver is like any movie that preceded it, and and I would make the case for, um, for um, and it may be going in style, can, can live up to that record, but certainly, um, yeah, certainly uh, that movie is, is an example of very special movie about the early days of Hollywood, about writing, about acting, and, and um, yeah, I think Hearts of the West, I think, lives up to that originality challenge. Before you had uh, done My Bodyguard, there was a, a short film you had directed, I believe, Ransom of Red Sheep. Oh, right. I forgot about that. You've was done that, a lot of homework. <laughs> <laughs> was that, uh, what was kind of the intention? Was that a television project, or? What happened was that as I was, as I was um, kind of wanting to make the transition to directing, as I was thinking, can I, can I do a good job as a director? Can I pull it off? Can I bring something to the table? I got a call from a friend of mine, Marion Rosenberg, who was an, a literary agent who was going to produce a, sh a short film, short in this case being, I think it ended up being about 40 minutes, um, of the classic O. Henry tale, uh, Ransom of, uh, The Ransom of Red Chief. And she said, would you be interested in like directing it? And I said, yeah. And so that was my introduction to directing. Uh, mm. That was my first film. So Ransom of Red Chief it, it, it was was my my trial by fire to see if I could to see if I could do, do a good job in five days. So it was it was all the it had all the earmarks of of the down and dirty short film challenge. You know, can you do it in five days? Can you do it with a bunch of people that are many of whom have never done a movie before. Uh, can you, you know, can you get it together? And we did. And it turned out really, turned out great. It was my, I thought it was my calling card. It turned out I didn't need it as a calling card. But like many things, what I needed it for was my own sense of confidence that I could pull it off. Mm -hmm facetiously think that if you're going to direct, you should get your acting degree and your producing degree mm -hmm. before you direct. Because you should learn how to talk to actors and deal with them. And you should learn how to be responsible to a, a budget and a schedule. Mm -hmm. um, two things that many directors seem to lack. There are a lot of directors that, you know, just if you talk to actors, they say, you know, he or she doesn't know how to talk to us. You know, they're, we're at a loss. Or they just don't know how to get the day's work done. They, they don't know how to prioritize or, or be responsible. So anyway, I always felt that I had to kind of prove myself in those two fields before I could ask somebody to give me millions of dollars to spend on a movie. So that's why it took me so long. So when you did uh, your first feature, My Bodyguard, 
Uh, were you confident going in? Did you prep a lot? Did you have a shot list? Did you really feel um, that strong foundation of being able to complete it? I was convinced that everybody had made a terrible mistake in asking me or letting me direct my bodyguard. Uh, a, a, a few nights before we started production, I felt that um, that the people who had given me the money, which was an independent company and really one guy named Mel Simon, uh, had misplaced their trust in me, had misplaced their faith in the script, and that if I had any integrity at all, I would call them up and say, we have all made a big mistake, we should cut our losses now and not even start shooting this movie. I, it was the most sleepless couple of nights of my life. And I took the coward's way out, and I said to myself, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and shoot it. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a cowardly act on my part to, to, to make that movie, because I knew that I would not do a good job, and I knew we shouldn't even be doing this kind of silly little piece of fluff about some kids, you know, like, there's no guns, there's no knives, there's nobody gets hurt, there's no food, there, there's, there's nothing in it that's commercial. And um, I just went ahead and said, you know, I've come this far, I have to, I've got to tough it out and do my, do my best to continue. And that first day that you were on the set, were you, were you nervous, were you I, I don't know if I was nervous. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if you can be nervous as a director because there's so much coming at you. There's that you just have to deal with. There's no time to be nervous. But uh, but I was just sure that there was that I didn't know what I was doing. You know, we started out that movie. The schedule on the movie we started with classroom scenes, which I found to be like deadly to stage and shoot. You know, like a bunch of people. A bunch of people in a room, four or five of whom have lines, some of whom just have one. They're all, t how do you cover it? How do you get the job, the day's work done? And of course, I had hired all non-actors. Mm -hmm. So I had to like deal with kids who had never acted before. It was just like, I was just sure it was going to be the worst. Just terrible. <coughs> yeah, absolutely positive. But once the no, no modesty here. I wasn't being modest. I was <laughs> sure it was going to be terrible. But I feel that way about every movie now. Uh, ever since. I just, I just know that this one is going to be the worst. Maybe it's sometimes good to start from that place and then it sort of makes your eye more <laughs> kind of... Uh, Linger on certain well, things to make sure maybe, but you know, I don't right. have a choice. I just, I'm just built that way. And I think that there are two schools of directors. There, as it boils down to it, I think that many directors feel that way. That this is just crazy. Why are we doing this? What is this? This is a stupid scene. This is a stupid movie. Uh, this is a stupid theme. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to be interested. It's, it's just. Trash. It's just never going to work. And there are, there are many directors who, who will admit to that. And then there are directors who say, this is great. I love being here. This is going to be great. This is going to be a great scene. You guys are great. And I don't know if they're faking it or they really feel that way. But I know that there, there is a school of directing that has great confidence and joy and fun and pleasure in showing up every day on the set and coping with whatever comes your way. Just as there are two schools, kind of two schools of directing on a technical level, which is shot lists. Here's how we're going to shoot this scene. It's going to, the camera's going to go here. We're going to get that shot. Then we're going to go over here. We're going to get that shot. We're going to do one here. And then we're out of here. Or we're going to cover it many ways, and then we're out. And then there's the school of directing, which is Let's all get together. Here's the, here's the room. Well, here's what's in the script. Maybe that works. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe, you know, maybe you shouldn't say that line there. Maybe we should add a line here. Maybe we don't need this moment. Let's kind of figure it out together, and then we'll shoot it with the amount of time we have left. Yeah. And that's my, that's my school, not the stay awake at night saying, here's where the camera's going to go tomorrow morning. We're gonna, first shot's going to be here. Second shot's going to be there. So you've never done a shot list for any of your 
you know, the television work, really? Or? I've I've done a kind of a shot list, especially when you have action scenes. Yeah. But basically, no, I'm not, I'm not a shot list guy. My bodyguard was successful right. and it was released. Did that fulfill your confidence more that you could really do this in the long term? Well, it, it always it always makes you feel better when a movie works. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a nice surprise that God, people really liked it. Oh, God, it got good reviews. Wow, what did we do? What did, the trouble is, you say to yourself, "What did I do right? What did I? What? How did I do it? How did I do a good job? How did that happen?" Instead of what I thought I was going to do, which is a bad job. Or uh, how does how is it that the movie's working and people are loving it? when I thought they wouldn't, or when all it was was a couple of kids sitting on a bench somewhere and people were crying. You yeah. just don't know. You don't know, and anybody, I think anybody who tells you that they know is either lying or, or uh, expecting to be very lucky with their guess, because you just cannot, you cannot know how a movie's gonna turn out. You just, just can't know. That even if the script you think is great, it still has to be executed, and if it's not executed properly, it can kind of... Well, but yeah, but what's executed yeah. properly? Executed properly means it works, and you can't know it's going to work. Yeah. I mean, some people throw the script away, you know, and diverge from it entirely. Some people, like, direct line, line readings. They tell you, no, no, say it this way. Everybody has a different way of directing or making a movie, Comple and it's often completely different than anybody else. And if it turns out to be a good movie, it was well directed. That's all you can say. Uh, when you're in post production and you know editing, uh, laying music, mm -hmm. uh, do you have notes going in of sort of conceptual ideas of how you want everything put together and Not how at the all. music should lay? Or not at all. No idea. Um, in fact, I don't. I don't work with the editor at first, um, and I don't tell the editor what to do at first. You know, my feeling is, like with all other jobs on this on the movie, basically, is that you hire people to do what they do best, which ought to be better than you can do it. You know, somebody ought to be able to shoot it better than I could shoot it, or act it better than I could act it, yeah. or you know. Put the sound, get the, get the quality of sound better than I could get it. Design a set better than I could design it. Those are the people you want to hire. And somebody ought to be able to edit the movie better than I could edit it, in a way. So my direction to the editor is not use this shot here and then cut to that shot there and be sure and use this. Although there can be notes where I can say, you know, I, I shot that little thing just because I really liked it. So, like, I thought it would really be great there, you know, cut away or whatever. Yeah. But my point is to the editor, save me from my mistakes. Here's all the stuff I shot. Put it together. Surprise me. I want to see a movie that I never imagined seeing. I don't want to see some movie that I knew it was going to look like. That would be pointless. So... Take all this stuff that I shot and call me when you're finished, which is basically the first cut. Yeah. So I don't want to see it. I don't want to be, I don't want to look at all this crap that I shot. Do you believe in like having an assembly cut or just going right to like kind of the first cut of what? Uh, no, I don't want to, I don't really want to see an assembly. I'm not interested in all the scenes that don't work. I'm interested in the ones that do. So I don't want to. I don't want to go home and shoot myself after I see the first cut, which I do anyway. Everybody does, I think. But no, I. If 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 you're editing my my footage and you say, or you don't say, you just do. You know what? This scene that Tony shot with this guy doing this is like, oh, it's it's boring. It's not working. We don't need it. It doesn't tell the story. It's it's not helping. Why would I want to see it in the, in the, in your cut? Yeah. So you show me, you give me your best shot. Is my my point? Show me the best movie you can make out of the footage that we shot, and then we'll talk about my opinion versus your opinion, or what I think, or whatever. 
you know, then we'll talk about, well, maybe I'll watch it and I'll say, you know what, I kind of miss that scene where the guy is, you know, uh, sitting there getting drunk at the bar. I kind of miss that here. Let's put it back in and see how, how it works. Or you'll say, as the editor, you'll say, yeah, but Tony, it doesn't match the light from the scene that before it, or it doesn't, you know, it, 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 he's not very good in that scene. <laughs> or, or, you know, here's why it's not there. And I'll say, well, you know what, you're right. Or let's try it anyway. Or let's try it somewhere else in the movie. Uh, one school of thought is, the camera's going to go here, we're going to do this, it's going to cut from there to there. I know it's going to do this, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how it's going to look, and it's all in your mind. You know, all, you know just how it's going to turn out. Uh, so the other s school of thought, which I said I'm stuck with, is, you know, we're not making the movie here on the set. We're shooting a lot of stuff, and then we're going to go into a room and make the movie out of all that stuff. Yeah. So don't worry about messing up. Don't worry about forgetting your lines. Don't worry about hitting your marks as an actor. Don't worry about all the stuff that makes actors worry. Did I, you know, did I say it the right way? Did, did I remember every word that was written? Did I say my line? Don't worry about that stuff. Do the job and a lot of the stuff that is a mistake is going to be wonderful. Stuff that you didn't know is going to happen. You know, when you, when you walk by the desk and you run into the desk, don't stop the scene because you ran into the desk. Because in real life, people run into desks. So I want to see what happens in real life here, not what is perfect acting. So if you hit the desk, if you slip and fall down, don't stop the scene. I'll stop the scene. That's my job. It's not your job to say what is good and what's not good, or what's working, what's not working, what's funny or what's not funny. So that's that's my big take on directing, is that what, what happens by accident is often the most interesting moments of the scene. Especially since a lot of film acting is sort of comes from the unconscious in a way. Whereas, you know, the camera's on you and, you know, that first time that you're mm -hmm. thinking that thought, it happens or you, you do some action physically. What happens or... the first time is, is, is often golden. That's the wonderful aspect of, of the digital revolution is that we got rid of all that film that you have to, like, pay for and, and, and reload and worry about. Uh, so we don't, we don't have to rehearse it. There's no such thing as rehearsal anymore. Why, it used to be you rehearsed a scene until it was not perfect, but you know it was rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed, and then say, "Okay, let's shoot it now." Well, that that always bothered me because so many of the wonderful things that actors come up with, or that happen between actors, happen the first time they do a scene. Yeah, it's fresh. It's like whoa, and then you say, "Well, let's do that again," and they say, "Well." What did I do? You know, I, I don't know what I did. I was just messing around. So those moments are have been lost forever in the film world, but in the digital world, they're there. You just turn on the camera, and you don't have to turn it off again until the end of the day. For me, the digital advantage on Flyboys of using this new camera that that. Uh, Panavision came up with called the Genesis was really it was all about the the actors about not having to worry about did we get that did we capture that um, lighting shooting editing I'm not sure there was any revolutionary difference from my point of view uh, except that uh, it was more easily manipulated in post if you, if you said oh geez I didn't realize there was like an airplane trail in the sky. It says, ah, we can get rid of that. So that's all wonderful. Um, but I just, I just love what, what you get from, from a, the day that you didn't get from the day when you were shooting film. Transitioning also to directing television from features, was that 
Uh, did you find a big difference in terms of creative control when you're on an episodic television show? Well, television, uh, episodic television is different in that you basically shoot what you, you do the day's work and then it goes off to other people to put together and make final decisions on. But I don't care about that uh, in that respect. Um, and in television, you have to work very fast. But I like working very fast. So I'm inclined to work fast even when I'm not required to, so to speak, in feature films. I, I work fast in features, too. Um, I, just, I just don't want to do 20 takes of anything ever. So... So what's you do maybe like three four takes at the most sometimes or are you uh, I'm I'm kind of a, a, a I'm kind of a yeah I'm kind of a three or four take guy in in the, on the average I have a personal kind of uh, not superstition but a kind of a personal challenge that um, I hope to make it through the whole movie with never going into double digit takes As a producer were you ever in a uh, in a bind where you saw a director sort of going over schedule or doing too many takes and you had to sort of intervene and say, you know, we have to move faster. Yeah, that was, that, that happened on one movie in particular, uh, on Hearts of the West. Uh, the director of Hearts of the West was a lovely guy named Howard Zeef. Howard Zeef, that was his second film. Howard Zeef was the Steven Spielberg of commercials. He was the most successful director of his day, practically, in commercials. In commercials, all you do is like 50 takes of everything. You know, taking a, taking a fork off the table and putting it in a, you know, it's just... <laughs> or lighting like a pizza until it's... Lighting a perfect. pizza, that's right. So uh, <laughs> that's commercials. And Howard came from that world. And so when we did Hearts of the West... I was just often at odds with him, even though I loved him. He was like a neat guy. But, you know, he was taking time out of his day, out of his shooting day, to do stuff. He just didn't, didn't have time. To, we don't have time and money to do that, Howard, you know. We don't have, even in pre-production, you know, he wanted to interview the extras. Mm -hmm. I said... We should, you, you're supposed to be out looking at locations today, not looking at extras. So that that one movie, I, I had to act like a producer, which I didn't enjoy doing. And, you know, just kind of like ramrod the, the, the day's work. You know, like, we got to be out of this. We got to be out of here by 3 o'clock, you know. Well, I can't get out of here. I got too many shots to do. Well, you know. Do fewer. <laughs> Stuff like that. When you acted in uh, Shampoo, from what I've read um, mm -hmm. on that set, it was sort of Hal Ashby was the director. Right. But at the same time, Robert Town and Warren Beatty, who were kind of writer producers on that, would yep. sort of come together as the three of them and take like long breaks between takes. And was that something that you thought, as just kind of your producing end coming out and saying, right. wow, should this really be happening? Or well, you know, every every set is different. You know, you go to anybody's set, and there's kind of a hierarchy. There's a kind of a tone. There's a kind of a of a, a, a speed of working. It's different. And on shampoo, it was different in that it, it's unusual on any movie to have a star as the producer, a writer on the set, and a director who is um, both very accomplished and very laid back mm -hmm. and very deferential. So you had all, th and, and all three of whom are heavyweights. You know, they're kind of superstars in their own arena. So it was, it was unusual to have, you know, a star who's a producer, a director, and a writer all talking about scenes after or before or even during they were being done. As an actor, I didn't care. I was just there to do my job. That was, that's the great pleasure of acting, really, is that you, you're just there to do your job. You're not there to 
wonder how it's going to cut together or how it's going to look or whether this scene belongs in the movie or whether it's working or not. It's not your job. You've acted, you've produced, you've directed. Uh, do you love one of those aspects even more, even though you haven't acted as much in the last years? Well, as I was saying about acting, acting is the most fun because you show up, everybody takes care of you, <laughs> uh, everybody's nice to you, nobody needs anything from you except just to show up on the set when you're needed. You don't have to worry about the day's schedule, you don't have to worry about where this scene belongs in the script. It's just, I don't want to say it's a mindless job, but it's a worry-free job. It's as close to worry-free as any job I can imagine. Now, if you're a big superstar, you worry, is this movie going to make money so I can keep on being a superstar? <laughs> you know, but that's, that's, that's a very specialized hybrid of actor worry. So acting is the most fun. You meet all the people, you know, you got a lot of time to yourself between takes. You don't have to, like, hurry up. Acting is the most fun. Producing is the most work for the least reward. Mm. Uh, you're a, a referee. You have, you, have to, you have to referee between the studio and the director, between the director and the actor, between the un, unhappy crew members and the other end. I mean, whatever it is, you're kind of in a, in a, a referee job. And then directing is the most difficult, and like almost everything in life probably, the most rewarding because it's the most difficult. If you if you survive it and pull it off and it works, you get you get all the credit. You get you get all the credit if it works. You also get all the blame if it doesn't. Hmm. So it's a kind of a fair deal. Yeah. But um, among them, directing and acting are certainly the most fun. Well, maybe directing is not fun, but it's at least the the most um, it's the most liberated because nobody's really telling you what to do, and so in that sense, you, you, you can you can you can value the experience even though you might not enjoy it. Is there an actor or a producer or director who's inspired you throughout your career as you were in the fields? I think a lot of I think a lot of filmmakers inspired me like I think early in my life before I was even in the movie business uh, I would say Truffaut's work felt good to me felt like right later on I mean I would say that of the directors whose work I admire of whom there are many um, I think Hal Ashby is exemplary in the sense that every movie he made was different than movies before it that, that, of his work, and he and he chose really quirky stuff to do. You know, being there is like, whoa, what's that like? You know, or uh, Harold and Maude, uh, or Coming Home. His, I just loved I loved all of his movies. Mm. And Sidney Pollack, who was a friend, uh, I loved all of Sidney's movies. So I like, I like movies that aren't like other movies for the most part. In fact, I thought once I would teach a class in, uh, and I would call it sui generis, which nobody would understand because it's Latin for one of a kind. But... I had a list of movies that are just not like any other movie that preceded or followed them. Just, they're one of a kind. Mm -hmm. And Because I, I, I thought it would be interesting for students to know that you don't have to make movies like other movies. You don't have to make, which everybody tries to do, you don't have to follow last year's success or last the last six years of style or, you know, script formula. You can make a movie that's just not like any other movie that's been made before it, and they exist.